But uh, yeah, really appreciate Steve. Thanks for including us uh, in the talk in post GIS day, which is always a, a super fun day and, and a uh, fabulous play on the on the name of the project as well. And uh, basically, what we want to talk about is a is a new project that the team at Pixelate Earth has been working on over the last uh, year plus to build a crowdsourced 3D map of the world. And uh, and it's very much both in in concept and execution a bit of an homage to OpenStreetMap in that you know, we really want to see if the same kind of community building that generated the awesomeness of OpenStreetMap could be applied to uh, a 3D world and specifically a 3D world for uh, enabling things like digital twins or mirror worlds, kind of the buzzy side of it. Um, and then kind of more applicably where we spend a lot of our time is, uh, is enabling augmented reality and autonomy. Um, and how 3D data can be used for, for those specific use cases. Um, but uh, I figure I'll dive in first uh, and talk a bit about the concept of what we're trying to do and, uh, um, and how we're going about that, and then dive into the specifics of how we're using PostGIS to enable it and make that all happen. Um, so I'll switch over to the handy uh, presentation deck, and then we'll go back to doing some live stuff if there's, uh, if there's still some time. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as like, you know, a business problem, because at, at the end of the day, the, one of the main differences between us and OpenStreetMap is that we're a, a, a business for profit, for profit uh, incorporated company. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons for that is that we wanted to make sure that what we built was economically viable and sustainable. Um, you know, we were involved in the, the early days of OpenStreetMap, and it's a wonderful project and fabulous community, but I feel like we're always scrapping to try to find money for servers and, um, and for folks to support the community and, and do kind of basic things. Uh, and so as we, as we built this out, we, we thought about, you know, what was an, an economically viable model that we could put in front of an open data project uh, and an open source software project to, uh, to uh, make it viable and sustainable for the for the community and not have to worry about some of these basic costs. Because um, that's one of the, the realities about if you're generating a large scale 3D map of the world that can be used for AR and autonomy and gaming and simulation applications, it's really expensive. And you know the people that play in this space traditionally are folks like Google and Apple and Microsoft and Facebook and Niantic and Snap, and they're all multi-billion dollar corporations with huge assets. Um, and the reason why they're the you know, probably the six folks that are out doing this at scale today, um, and there's probably some other folks that I'm, I'm leaving out, but um, um, at least the ones that are kind of household names, which we definitely aren't, uh, is, uh, is because it's really expensive, right? You know, the cost of, of driving a 600 vehicle um, Google Street View fleet um, isn't cheap. I mean, it's, they've, they've driven down the cost quite a bit. My estimates are based on data from like 2014, 2015. So I'm probably off on what it actually costs today to do these things because they don't share the data anymore, but, um, but it's still expensive, right? It's, it's not something that a, that a volunteer project can, can go out and do to build these things in 3D. And both the, the collection of the data, the, how expensive the cameras and sensors are is really expensive. The, uh, the compute for managing and running and hosting all this data is really expensive. Um, and, uh, and those things all add up over time to make for, for an expensive project. Um, and so as we dove into this, we, we started thinking about, you know, how can we drive those costs down to make it accessible for crowdsourcing where anybody could push data in and, and get 3D maps out of the backside of it. Um, uh, and, and one of the, the tricks that we used for doing this was, was thinking about a hybridized map that, um, you know, uh, we see this a lot in, in, uh, in, in like 2D maps um, that, you know, if you go into your basic Google map or Microsoft map or um, uh, or other folks that are out there, you'll see a variety of data sources that are listed, right? Sometimes you're using Digital Globe or Maxar satellites, sometimes you're using aerial data from, um, from Hexagon or Vexcel or Eagle Eye or somebody like that. You're also pulling open data from USGS, Landsat, um, or Sentinel program from Copernicus in the, in the European Union. And all those things allow you to provide a hybridized map that is uh, um, economical and you can afford it. You know, you're using some for fee services, you're using some open data services, you're using sometimes your own services. Some of these folks fly their own um, air fleets to collect data. Um, some of the, the big tech companies do um, and, and drive their own street view collections as well. Um, but in 3D, typically, you know, when folks are doing this for like autonomy and augmented reality and 
and 3D stuff within mapping, they're, they're typically using a single sensor um, to go and collect all these things. Because if you're using one sensor to collect the world, the amount of calibrations and bundle adjustments and things that you need to do are, um, are much more limited um, and feasible for uh, making a, a cohesive 3D world that's accurate. Um, and so what we did that was a little bit different, we said, you know, can we take the same principles that we've learned from 2D mapping with, with satellites and aerial and, and vector data and mashing but together a bunch of data sources to make a viable map? Could we apply that to 3D also? Could we hybridize it and pull from a wide variety of different data sources with different cost factors and accuracy factors and fuse them into kind of a best of breed map? Um, and that's what we, uh, what we aim to, to go do. Um, so on, on one hand, we leveraged um, open reference data. So stuff like um, aerial LIDAR that's flown by the US Geological Survey or DEFRA in the UK, or um, you know, there's a variety of, of government and state and local organizations that fly aerial LIDAR and make that open data. Same thing with, um, with aerial oblique data um, as well. There's also satellites that provide um, synthetic aperture radar or even uh, LIDAR from space um, and things like SRTM. Um, so you get a variety of these of these different kind of reference data sets that tell us where things are in the world and what their altitude is and their latitude and their longitude, sometimes as good as five or 10 centimeters, sometimes as, as coarse as like with SRTM as being 90 meters. Um, uh, but these things are great. They're, they're references and you can kind of patch them together to get a, a nice um, elevation reference for the globe. Um, and then on the flip side, or say the, the downside of these is that they don't get updated very often, right? You know, flying, uh, flying airplanes is expensive. Purchasing that data is expensive. Governments don't do it um, on a super frequent basis. So the, the data can be out of date by multiple years very easily. Um, then on the flip side, you have um, all of these cameras that are collecting data all over the globe now, whether it's uh, you know, vehicles, uh, in-vehicle cameras, dash cams, uh, action cameras like GoPros and Insta360s, and uh, you have drones from DJI and folks like that are, that are collecting data. Then you have our phones and apps that are constantly collecting photos and videos of all sorts of different things. Um, and the cool thing there with, with all of these is that the, the data is super temporally accurate. You know, it's very fresh. People are collecting it on a, on a regular basis. But the accuracy is, is pretty crappy. You know, it's GPS, and if you're in an urban area where the most interesting data and features are, you know, it can be anywhere from 10 to 50 to 100 meters off. Um, so trying to use that to create an accurate 3D map of the world is, is kind of challenged. Um, but the core idea, which, which actually came from Pramukta, our, our CTO, um, from uh, some work he had been doing uh, at a postdoc at Stanford, was, um, was fusing these data sets together. Um, and he had been doing some ecological work in the Amazon using LIDAR to train a neural net so that planet uh, dove imagery could be used to do carbon estimations, which sounds completely um, uh, tangent, tangential to what we're doing, but it ended up that the, the mathematical methodology was pretty, was, uh, was a nice fit, right? So if you can take, say, something like aerial LIDAR data and use that as your spatial reference, and then you can take a bunch of commodity video and use that use photogrammetry to create point clouds, then you can co-register those things together. Now you have a, a 3D map that's accurate temporally, accurate spatially, um, and it's easy to update and cheap to update as well. Um, so that's kind of the core concept. I probably spent way too much time on that slide. Uh, but um, going to the next step is, you know, that was one side of it of, of getting the collection to be cheap, right? If we can use these cheap cameras that are ubiquitous and everywhere, and we can use open reference data to put that into the right place, uh, then our collection costs are much cheaper than having to operate a big street view fleet um, all over the world. Uh, the next big challenge is compute. Um, you know, running these things, there was a paper that Google published where they took all of the street view data for the globe and they uh, bundle adjusted it and turned it into sparse point clouds. And, uh, and that took them, it was 2000 years of compute on a single CPU. And obviously they do these things parallelized, but it's you know, a huge amount of compute. And if, if we had to pay for that in Google's cloud or Amazon's cloud, we would go bankrupt um, probably a, a tenth of the way through the processing. Um, so we needed to figure out a, a better way to do that. Um, and so again, we kind of went back to the geomatics and the spatial reference, um, which is a bit of our the team's DNA coming out of you know satellite and GIS um, to uh, to cheat. Uh, and so basically, instead of trying to bundle adjust the whole world or bundle adjust an entire city, we said let's just bundle adjust and create point clouds for a 20 second clip of the video. So let's make a really small point cloud. Um, we'll, we'll generate that from 20 seconds of video and then we'll put it into our spatial reference and we'll use odometry and graph pose optimization to line up the next 20 second bit of video and then we'll set that into the, into the reference. 
Um, and then we'll be able to stitch these things together because we have a nice consistent spatial reference to do so. We don't have to try to arbitrarily run this thing as one massive batch. Um, and, and that really drove down the cost. So instead of it costing hundreds of dollars per kilometer to process this data, again, my, my Google data is, is old and people at Google would probably say, you know, uh, we've cut that in half, um, but um, we really needed to drive it down even, even cheaper than that. So um, what we were able to do with that compute approach was get it down to $1.58 per kilometer. Um, and when, you, when that's what it costs, somebody can go collect, you know, two and a half gigabytes of data over a kilometer, and that costs us $1.58 to go process that and turn it into a full fidelity um, point cloud um, densified and a feature database generated against that. Um, for that cost, that means we can now start to go do crowdsourcing because if somebody gives us bad data or they collect something that's not interesting or they've recollected something somebody else did, did five minutes ago, it's not gonna break the bank to go process that. Where if it's a couple of hundred dollars per kilometer, the, the viability of the project would fall apart pretty quickly. Um, so those were kind of our two big hurdles that we had to solve to turn this into kind of a viable crowdsourcing challenge that was uh, could feasibly be done. Um, and then on the backside of that is we still needed to build something that would be compelling that people would want to contribute to that I want to go create some video of my block so I'm going to get something cool back in return for it. Um, and so that's really where the photogrammetry side comes in. So people upload videos and we get these high level of detail models. So this is um, a kind of a condo bank confab and boulder. Um, and you can get some, some really nice detail on this and then you can generate meshes from it and do those kind of traditional 3D products that you see in something like Google Maps or Google Earth or Microsoft Virtual Earth back in the day. Uh, but then you can do other cool things for mapping, which is semantic classification. Um, so we originally did this to anonymize data to remove things like cars and people because you don't want those in your data because it makes for, uh, for bad data when you're doing localization and things for AR and autonomy. Um, but it's also bad practice from a privacy and ethical standpoint if we don't want personally identifiable information for people getting into the database. Um, uh, but the upside of that is in addition to do, doing it for anonymization, you can also use it to say, hey, I want to pull out the buildings. Um, I want to pull out the street furniture, uh, the fire hydrants, the post office boxes, you know, anything you want to train the classifier to go and find. And those are cool things that you can go and map um, to pull out specific assets from a GIS perspective, which is really cool. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of had this going, we wanted to start testing out actually uh, building things. Um, so we, we had a, in the tradition of OpenStreetMap, um, we had a map party where we invited uh, a bunch of folks to come out and take pictures and shoot video of downtown Boulder. And then we aggregated it all up into a model and shared that all out as open data under a public data license. Um, and we learned some, some interesting things doing that, that you know, video was a lot more effective than photos. Um, photos are actually a little bit more accurate. We get like 25 centimeter accuracy off the survey baseline. Video is like 50 centimeters, but you know, the people taking photos, it took them half a day to do what the folks with like a 360 video camera did in about 20 minutes. Um, so obviously there's, there's good use cases for both, which we'll get into here in a, in a second, um, pulling those across, um, which is that if you wanna do a baseline mapping, existing commodity video or going collecting some video is a really effective way to cover a large geography very fast um, and get a baseline mapping for the city. Um, but once you get that baseline mapping, Updating that um, where you need a 360 camera, which is a little bit specialty. I mean, you can buy a GoPro for a couple hundred bucks and, and there's lots of 360 cameras out there, but obviously it's not something that everybody's walking around with. Uh, whereas with a cell phone, everybody has that. People are taking pictures, shooting video all the time. There's dash cams, they're just collecting data all the time. Um, and then we can use those to update the map. Um, so we have this process we call reintegration where we take an image, we pull out feature descriptors, we do some depth mapping, and then we paint that image onto the 3D model that we created with our, our baseline. And then between the two, we look at that as a pretty effective strategy to go out and, uh, and create a perpetually updating crowdsourced uh, 3D map of the globe. So you have baseline mapping, but then you know the, the world's always changing, especially in 3D. Um, and we want to be able to update that um, on a regular interval and basis. And so kind of look at this as the blended strategy for, for making that happen. Um, and then kind of comes the next step, right? If you know. We get, we get these pieces in line that we've been slowly building out with the team. Um, then we need people to go collect data. So we've started this ambassador program. Um, uh, one, because scaling this amount of infrastructure isn't trivial. We didn't wanna just open it up to the entire world and say, start dumping data and the system falls over because um, we don't understand what those, those parallel loading patterns look like. Um, so we, 
started this ambassador program, which is a kind of a bald faced ripoff of uh, CloudMade, which was a, a startup that uh, um, was generated, one of the first ones generated around OpenStreetMap data. And they had an ambassador program where they sent people out to go encourage them to go do OpenStreetMap mapping. Um, so we, uh, we, we borrowed the name and, uh, and used a similar concept where we're recruiting people in different parts of all, of, all over the country um, that are interested in doing 3D mapping, interested in going out and collecting video of their neighborhoods, their towns, their cities, and then uploading it into the system. And then we give them a 3D model under an open data license. They can go do whatever they want with, and anybody else can go do whatever they want with. It's, a, it's an open data, possible for commercial, no virality, just commercial commons, I'm sorry, creative commons with attribution, just because we want people to know where it came from. So more people will go back and contribute. Um, and this is a, a map of the folks that have applied so far. I think this is back when we had about 50 applicants, we're up to about 80 applicants um, and looking for more applicants, um, especially more women. If anybody in the audience is interested, we'd love to have you participate. So far the contributions um, are the, the applicants have been really male heavy. Um, uh, the good news is there's been lots of diversity around geography and ethnicity. Um, and race, which is fabulous to see, but um, but male dominated, unfortunately. So if anybody on the call is interested in something like this, we'd love to have you. And I'll have a link at the end, and I'll also tweet out um, with the PostGIS hashtag if anybody's interested in the ambassador side of things. Um, and then here's basically what what we're providing back to the community with doing these things. Are these high level of detail 3D models? So our first ambassador is in London, and uh, they've been going out collecting data. Um, all around downtown London, mainly in Soho, City of London, and the area in between around the kind of the Barbican and, and so forth. Um, and these are just some some screenshots, screen captures from from that data collection, just to kind of see the, the fun level of detail that you get out of this um, as we run through it. Um, so obviously, you know the, the the purpose of this talk is to talk about PostGIS, and so far I've not talked about PostGIS at all. So um, I apologize for not bringing it up sooner, but. Um, figured the what we're actually doing with PostGIS isn't terribly novel or unique, but the, the cool thing is it's just the bread and butter of why PostGIS is awesome and why we use it for everything that we do. Um, and so uh, we think the use case is interesting, um, but, the, but the bread and butter that enables that use case, I think, is also kind of key to see just the flexibility and the quickness we're able to scale up a project of, of this kind of magnitude with uh, a team of four people. Um, I have, you know, five with include some, some other uh, contractor intern kind of folks. Um, but, uh, but basically, you know, the way that we're running this is that, uh, is that PostGIS manages all of the metadata across the project, um, as well as all of the, the operational interfaces to how the web application runs. Um, so we have a bit of, a, of a, an interesting taxonomy that's specific to what we do with point clouds and 3D reconstructions, um, and that we have users. Obviously, I didn't make a screenshot of users because uh, we, you know, privacy side is important, but within those, um, I grabbed some of the, the users in here that were just our engineers, um, so just folks that are on the team. And so Chris Helms, so I'm sure probably some folks on the call are familiar with, who's been a long time collaborator and awesome engineer. Um, these are some of, of his examples and other folks that, that work on the team uh, directly. But the, the taxonomy side of it is, so we, we have users that are out there collecting data, uploading it um, into the system and creating 3D models. Uh, and what they upload are streams. And so streams are um, a set of images. And those set of images could be discrete photos taken uh, from a mobile device or a regular DSLR camera, um, or they could be frames out of a video. Um, and they could be a 360 video. So you can see some examples here of fisheye lenses um, that came from a, a 360 uh, video. Um, other ones are equal or rectangular. Um, so each one of those different camera types um, we end up having to deconstruct those, uh, those sensors and create a model for managing them um, so that we can decompose those frames and, and rectify them in the appropriate way um, so that we can run them through the pipeline. And so those streams of images uh, then get pushed into clouds. Um, and uh, within those clouds uh, is where we get the point clouds. And so um, those, get, uh, those get rectified, they get really precise geographic positions. Um, and they get cleaned and worked through and processed and so forth. And, and all that data is, is uh, that metadata is managed in PostGIS. The actual point clouds themselves um, sit in, a, in an S3 bucket or a GCS bucket or whatever cloud provider that you're, you're using. Um, and then they're, they're indexed uh, by PostGIS and then the metadata for finding and locating those clouds sitting within the, uh, uh, in the cloud buckets is, is all managed within PostGIS. Um, 
So we think of, of those, uh, so you, you upload a video, um, you get a point cloud, and then you can take those point clouds and put them into groups. And so one of these might be like a, a section of uh, University of Colorado at Boulder um, or different tests that we've been running. You can uh, put these projects together. It might be a city, you know, I wanna group a whole bunch of things together and this is gonna be London um, or it's gonna be Boulder um, where the case may be. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also um, obviously use the GIS functions within PostGIS where each one of those uh, point clouds has a footprint. And so we use the PostGIS functions to, uh, to generate a footprint for each one of those point clouds. And then we can track coverage that we have um, for different geographies. So this is like from our very first mapping project that we did uh, you know, about a little over a year ago. And some of the areas where people collected data, we can see where it was missed. And then I might go back and fill in those areas that were missed um, and pushed across it. Um, the other key part of this that we've talked about is we have uh, references. Um, so when the raw point clouds come in, they have you know uh, a rough geolocation based on GPS. Uh, and then we go and we load in a reference. Uh, so the cool thing is, in addition to crowdsourcing the data, we've also put in the ability to crowdsource references. Um, so a lot of these references we load up ourselves, uh, but we also wanted to, uh, you know, trying to build a reference for the entire globe for everybody that could be participating in the project was pretty daunting. Um, so we put in the ability for folks to be able to upload and maintain and manage their own references as well. So that could be something, you know, as simple as, hey, I'm in Finland. Finland has an, an open LIDAR reference that's available for anybody. I just download the, uh, the tiles that I want or the, the quads from, uh, from the Finnish open data service. And then I upload that and I have a reference for Helsinki and I'm ready to go to go map, uh, map Helsinki with a high level of detail. Um, and if there is no reference available for an area, you can also just do it without and we'll use the best positioning that we can do through odometry and postgraph optimization to, um, uh, to put those into place and, and get them all good to go. Um, uh, and it just won't be quite as accurate as when we do have the reference. Um, and then there's also other opportunities for folks that are out there flying drones and using ground control points and they're creating uh, you know, 3D point clouds and meshes with stuff like open drone map, um, you could upload that as a reference. If, uh, so we've you know, had a bunch of people that are really interested and excited about doing 3D mapping um, in Africa um, and, and doing ground-based uh, models with the, uh, with the system. But, you know, there, but there's, there's really a paucity of these expensive open uh, LIDAR data sets that are uh, available um, on the Africa continent. Um, and so we've been talking to a lot of the folks that have been out there doing drone mapping to kind of fill that gap and especially the folks doing open drone mapping and seeing if there's opportunities to fuse these things together. And that's where this kind of open crowdsource reference really starts to get exciting in our minds is that you can begin to use it to fuse multiple projects together. Um, people that are out there saying, hey, I want to take the reference I did from drone mapping and then I want to go do some terrestrial mapping. I want to fuse these things together and have more open data that we can, we can push out and provide to folks. Um, then last but not least, we have our pipelines that are sitting in the back, which are kind of glorified queues that are doing uh, builds and post-processing post -processing and depth maps and managing the videos and splitting them and doing all that kind of uh, good stuff. Um, actually, I read those backwards. You start with the video and you split it, then you do your feature extraction, then you do your depth maps, then you do your post-processing, and then you build your 3D model. Um, this is what I get from the uh, habit of going from top to bottom. Uh, but uh, and here you can see some projects that have run through. And if it's failed, like some of uh, Chris's projects that have failed or Pramukta's, you can go view the logs and, and dig into the reasons that those things uh, didn't quite work out. Uh, and last but not least, you know, uh, some more detail on some of that, uh, the ambassador projects that have been, been popping out. Um, this is a really cool one of a, of a theater in, in downtown London, London on Kingley Street. Um, but it's just cool to see one of the things that's been really fun for me is, you know, it being in lockdown, being in lockdown in Boulder, Colorado is definitely a, uh, um, uh, a problem of the, of the first world privilege of it's, there's mountains and great places to go hang out. But, um, uh, but it's been really cool to be able to see other places that I can't go right now. And as, as we get these cameras out to folks and they start exploring their neighborhoods and uploading those and, and getting 3D models back, being able to kind of interactively go through and uh, experience those has been been, been a lot of fun. Uh, and that's hopefully something that as the project goes forward, you have, uh, more folks will be able to experience and explore these, these places um, and download the data and hopefully do cool, fun things with it. Um, but that kind of runs through um, what I have from the slide perspective. 
Um, the ambassador link is that uh, Google form there at the bottom, um, or feel free to email me or, or tweet at me and I'll, I'll post, that, uh, post that link back if anybody's interested in potentially being an ambassador. Um, again, we'd love to get, uh, get more folks uh, lined up for that program and, uh, and get it launched here in the next week or so. Um, but um, uh, I guess, does it make sense, Steve, to do some, some questions or I can go and show some, some live stuff um, I think let's try. Way. We're just about at time for the session, but you know we have the fifteen minutes. Let's see if we got some questions. I think. Cool. Do we have any questions from anybody? I mean, I, I mean, it seems to me like one of the really great things about using PostGIS in this is that you also get PostgreSQL, right? So mm -hmm. in addition to the spatial, you can you don't have to have multiple data stores. You can actually use one data store for both your, for your geography data and also for your metadata, right? And so. You're not managing between the two. Is that one of the reasons you chose PostGIS, or is it just because it was great spatial stuff and you love spatial stuff? Um, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think it's, it's a bit unusual for the team because we've been so spatially heavy as a as a as a group. But you know, I, I'd say we probably use the Postgres SQL side even more than we do the the PostGIS and spatial extensions. Um, but you know, the, the fact that we don't have to worry about it, right? It's just one uh, one continuous platform that's well supported and uh, does everything we need is, is awesome because we have so many photogrammetry headaches and uh, Kubernetes headaches that it's, it's, it's awesome. Like there's there's not there's never a day that we have a post just rabbit hole um, where we spend the entire day trying to figure out how to configure and run and get post just to do what we want. It just happens, which is great. You know, it's and that's kind of, you know, what I was saying about the bread and butter of, of post just is that it's uh, you know we kind of take it for granted, which is amazing because there's there's so many things where where we just lose days and weeks trying to configure um, other technologies to get them to do what we want to do on a predictable basis, and to have something that's so bomb proof that we never worry about is is awesome. Okay, um, we got a question from Marat saying, um, "Sorry if I missed. Did you use PG Point Cloud extension in any of your pro, pro in any of your pro, uh, processes?" Uh, no, we didn't. Actually, I see Paul on here, and, I, and it, we've had some conversations with Paul about about uh, about looking at that. And I think you know the the, the general recommendation for um, you know, especially for the size of point clouds that we're talking about. You know, even like this one that we're looking at. You know, just within this view is millions of points, and we start talking about a global model with um, billions, trillions of these points. Um, it uh, it just becomes challenging, and really wasn't what I think you know the Postgres is really intended for, um, but you know, being able to store these things in in cloud buckets and um, index them and manage them all through PostGIS um, has been a fabulous hybrid uh, between the two, and and I, I think that's probably the general recommendation we we've gotten talking to folks that are smarter on this than I am for sure, and and the team in general is that um, is that you know a good practice for the the kind of scale that we're we're working at with this project in particular. Um, but not necessarily a comment on the extension, just uh, more a comment on, on the specifics or our use case, um, a hybridized model made more sense. Right, I mean, if you talk to Paul about raster images too, he's like, yeah, I, I don't really want you storing raster images directly in the database, right? Mm -hmm. He's very much don't put big binary objects into the database or the, that kind of stuff. Um, so I got another question. Why does it matter whether your contributors are male or female? Do you feel images or locations are skewed based on gender? Um, I think that a community issue should reflect the world, right? If you want to have a um, a crowdsourced map of the globe and you want a community to reflect that, that you should try to do what you can to make your community reflect the globe. And women are half the population. And you know, if, if you're not seeing that reflected in your community, then um, then you're probably not doing outreach correctly. And I think that was, for us, you know, we went through and started looking at, you know, the statistics of folks that were that were uploading into the into the form, and and saw that that was uh, an area that we were lacking, and so we've tried to create outreach and encourage folks to uh, to create a better reflection of that. And I think you know, communities are like organizations that you know the the better the the breadth of uh, of opinions and perspectives, the better the project's going to be. Um, and I think that's just a a good core community building value. Um, I don't think there's necessarily, um, you know, uh, anything in our experience that says data collection by gender um, has 
large or meaningful differentials. Um, but I think community composition is important and, and having a holistic community and trying to incentivize that is an important you know, part of our, um, of our mandate and mission as being the folks facilitating this. Okay, um, we've got two more questions. Uh, let's see, Tony asks, are you able to assess the, are you able to access the X, Y, Z of each point in the point cl cloud and if so, what is the accuracy like? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so so every every point in the point cloud is indexed. Um, the accuracy is between uh, twenty five and fifty centimeters of the survey reference. Uh, so, for instance, in this case, we're looking at a reference for London that uh, um, you can get uh, uh, open lidar data from Defra that has a uh, uh, fifteen centimeter accuracy. Um, but actually, for each survey, you can get the ground truth that they measured. Uh, so basically, they'll say it's within 15 centimeters is the worst case scenario. You can go and look at the specific ground truth for this tile within the National LiDAR program for the UK. And there, uh, there are five survey control points for all either three centimeters or four centimeters accuracy. Um, so that's generally what you're looking at. You're looking three or four centimeters plus 25 centimeters to 50 centimeters um, total accuracy from absolute real world ground truth. Um, so it's, it's perfect for things like augmented reality. Um, it's probably perfect for delivery uh, robotics or robotics that don't involve big, heavy moving cars. Um, you know, whether or not that's good enough for like car autonomy is, is you know, still a bit of an open question and people are figuring that out. Um, and usually our, our kind of data comes into play when you want to uh, deal with really large geographies, entire cities, entire countries. Um, if you're just doing a small prototype um, area and you can, it's feasible to go drive a really expensive LiDAR equipped car and, and collect even more precise data. Um, but obviously that doesn't become scalable when you wanna have global autonomous fleets or citywide autonomous fleets and keeping that up to date. Um, so I'd say that's kind of like where we sit from an accuracy perspective, generally speaking. Okay, and the last one comes from Mr. Point Cloud himself, Howard Butler. And he says, um, what does ubiquitous handheld LiDARs mean for you, if anything? Like, because all the Apple iPhones, now the newest ones have a LiDAR, the iPads have LiDAR. So what, does, is that helping you? What, how's it impacting your project? Um, yeah, I think the uh, well, one, I should probably caveat that we're, we're heavy users of, of Poodle and EPTs across the stack for this. Um, and uh, obviously we're talking about post just primarily today, but there's several other open source projects we're highly indebted to and, and Howard's uh, the progenitor of one of the major ones. Um, uh, on the on the LiDAR phones, I think it's it's really exciting to see where that technology is going. I mean, there's definitely challenges with the five meter range um, of the, the current iPhone Pro 12s. And, uh, and I still haven't seen, there's probably a dozen reality scanning apps that are using that now. Um, I haven't seen a lot of stuff on the accuracy of people trying to geolo geolocate those. The only ones I've seen that's, that's talked about Georeferencing or georectifying the data is a Pix4D app, and I haven't had a chance to test it out yet to see kind of what that level of accuracy is. Um, but from our standpoint, it's it's awesome because we have a way to take that lidar data and align it with our reference, um, and and to facilitate that. So you know, there being an army of of lidar scanners out there that could be collecting data is is amazingly encouraging and really exciting. Um, you know, there's definitely limitations with five meters to what you can do outdoors with that, and what that uh, you know also impacts of sunlight on on some of that collection that's suboptimal compared to indoor use cases, which is I think where the, the scanner was primarily geared towards. Um, but that all said, if you look at the first iPhone cameras, like they're pretty crappy, right? you know, really fuzzy, it wasn't great pixel density, um, and you look at how quickly those cameras improved. Um, I think we'll see a similar trajectory with the lidar scanners on the phones as well. That you know, each iteration as Apple and as other companies like Samsung and, and Google and others pick up the technology and integrate it into their phones, that the ranges are just going to get better and better, and the use cases are going to get better and better, um, and the, the potential for having millions of people out collecting lidar scans that can be uh, integrated into a project like this is is obviously the holy grail of, of what we'd like to get to. Um, but but you still have the fundamental challenge of how do you stitch all these things together and make them cohesive versus having a bunch of, of random um, uh, scans floating around. Like, you know, Sketchfab is an amazing uh, 
service and capability that has thousands, millions of scans of places all over the world as well as objects, but there's no way to stitch all these things together into one cohesive 3D experience or globe. And, and that's the core problem we're trying to solve. You know, the technology for collecting the scans is gonna evolve and get better and better. Um, but really the core thing we wanna do is, is, is to turn it into that spatial real world um, uh, from a computational standpoint. Okay. Well, with that, um, we have eight minutes until our next talk. So I want people to be able to get a bathroom break and get a snack. Um, thanks again, Sean. That was really fascinating and exciting to hear, except exciting in the sense that push yes is just easy, right? Like there was somebody who put in the chat, like losing week, days and weeks to trying to install software. He's like, oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one, right? So <laughs> it's really kind of refreshing to have someone who just says, look, it's not rocket science that we're doing it but it makes us eat things easy for us and just get stuff done so i really appreciate it thanks a lot um there are some other questions in the chat that you can respond to if you want to um like someone says how far off are we mapping our world to accuracy levels indiscernible from reality how about blurring out license plates and faces etc and then there was a request for the ambassador link a bunch of people are just putting um explore.pixel8.earth but if you can, you send it to me, um, yep. I'll post I'll post the links in both the Discord channel and in the regular chat. Sound good? Awesome, yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, and we, we just did a blog post on privacy and blurring and semantic segmentation and all that good stuff. So I'll, 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 I'll share both those, both those back. Cool, thanks a lot. Thank you.